everybody. My name is Dr. Janelle Ott. I teach double reads at Angelo State University in San Angelo, Texas, and I also teach bassoon at Abilene Christian University and McMurray University in Abilene. Uh, before I moved to San Angelo, I spent several years teaching private lessons in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, so I wanted to make a video for my students, for anyone else out there to help learn their all region etudes for 2022 to 2023. Uh, so we're going to talk about the etudes first. I'm going to try to give you a strategy to learn. I'm going to highlight some difficult parts and some things you need to think about. And then I'll do a playthrough at the very end of this video. And I really, really, really hope that it's perfect. I haven't been working on this music very long. I've had it for about a week. So hopefully everything will be great. If it's not great, then um, take it as learning experience. Instead of just expecting it to be perfect, if I mess something up, make sure you don't mess it up. I probably messed it up because there's something difficult about it, I would like to think. Um, okay, so the All Region Etudes this year are taken from the Mildy Concert Studies. There are several editions of these concert studies available, but the All Region Etudes are taken specifically from this edition of the Mildy Concert Studies. So those are the international edition by Simon, or Simon Kovar. Simon Kovar edited this. Um, I would recommend that if you have a different edition, that's fine, but find an edition edited by Simon Kovar to compare to your part. If you need a part for reference, uh, my friend Sarah Boyd has a copy of the All Region Etudes on her website, thereadlab.com. If you go to the student page, you'll be able to find a PDF. Please buy your own copy of the Etudes, but that's a good place to go for reference. You'll find that the, sh the um, Kovar edition has a lot of dynamics written in to help you form your interpretation of the piece. There are also some different notes, so definitely check it out if you're using a different edition. All right, something that we have to deal with every single year that the Mildy Concert Etudes are the All Region Etudes is that all of the Mildy Etudes have a lot of tenor clef in them. Tenor clef is a different clef system from bass clef. So what what we have, what we're used to playing is bass clef. This is bass clef. You've seen it, I hope, before. And uh, the way that we, that bass clef works is bass clef is what we call an F clef. It's called an F clef because the way the, the clef is written, it's designed to show you where the note F is. So where those two dots are, that is F. Tenor clef is a C clef. So here's what tenor clef looks like. And where the two backwards C's come together, that note is C. But it's also the C that's above the staff in bass clef. So the note that is on the second line from the top is this note. Not this one. This one. Okay. Why did composers write in tenor clef? I could give you reasons. I'm sure you've heard reasons. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter why they did it. They did it, and it's our job to figure out how to play it. So if you are new to tenor clef, I have a video for how to learn to read tenor clef. I will link it in the description for this video. But the short version of what I'm going to tell you is don't procrastinate. It will be on your All Region A2 music every single year. It will be worse in the years that you have Mildy concert studies, but it will always be on the All Region Etudes. If you need to write in notes, write in notes, but don't write in every single note. Even leaving out one note in a measure is going to make you much more likely to notice and fix mistakes as you write them down. Um, that's the short version. Uh, please watch my video on tenor clef for more information. All right, other things that we need to look at. So this is actually a pretty tricky etude number one, in my opinion, and there are a couple of reasons for this. First of all, it's in three. My experience is that playing anything in a meter of three is more uncomfortable 
because we're just not used to listening to music that's in three very much. It's just always a little weird for us. The second reason it's tricky is because uh, it starts out with four sharps in the key signature, and I know that's going to make a lot of people unhappy, but the truth is you have to learn how to play in these key signatures. So you can be upset about it, but you still have to learn it. Um, there's also a key change about halfway through the etude. So now we're in flat land, but it's five flats, um, which is not the easiest key signature to read either. We're not super used to five flats. The third thing that makes this one a little tricky is that we have three different musical sections and each musical section should have its own character. So the beginning of the etude starts out very light, almost playful, um, like so. The second section begins in measure 45, which is where the key change is. If you don't have all your numbers, your measures numbered, I would recommend you do it. It's going to make rehearsal a lot easier and it will also make listening to this video a lot easier for you. Um, so the key change starts in measure 45 and this is our second musical section. We're going to go something to something that's still kind of playful, but it's a much more connected legato feeling than the opening. <laughs> And then the third section begins at the repeat sign, that's measure 77. This one is interesting because it's also very legato, but it's written in such a way that it actually sounds like it's in two instead of in three. So here's how that third section starts. <laughs> this is tricky, here's my strategy for you for how to learn it. I believe in something that is called the hierarchy of learning, which means you don't try to do everything from the very, very beginning. You need to have an order in which you try to learn how to play a piece. And the very first thing you need to do is play the right notes. Before you worry about anything else, play the right notes. I'm going to give you a spoiler, we're going to skip ahead to the very, very end of the process. The very last thing you get to worry about in the hierarchy of learning is your tempo. So the idea is that you start learning the piece at a pretty slow tempo. You want to be looking for something that I call your perfect practice tempo. And the way you know that you have your perfect practice tempo is as you're playing, your anxiety level on a scale of one to 10 should be at a two, maybe a three but probably a two. Two means that you're having to still pay attention. You can't just fall asleep at that tempo, but you're pretty sure everything you're doing is going to be the right thing. You feel like you're in control. You don't feel like you're just waiting for the piece to fall apart. You feel pretty confident that exactly what you want is what's going to happen. Usually your perfect practice tempo is going to be very slow, but that is okay. This is where the important work happens. So grab a metronome and find whatever tempo you need so that you can get through the piece. If you need to break it up into sections, fine, break it up into sections. At the end of your practice session, and this is very important, write in your tempo. Do not tell yourself you're going to remember the tempo, write it in. And then tomorrow, when you practice it again, you start right at that tempo. And if it doesn't go faster, that's okay. If it does, write in the new tempo. That level of organization is going to make you much more efficient in your practicing and it's going to save you a lot of time. All right, so step one, play the piece at a tempo. And what I recommend you do, because I like having the metronome on almost immediately, is have your metronome giving you eighth notes, not one beat per measure, three beats per measure. So it would sound something like this.
until you get something that sounds more like this. This is 120. Now once you get up into this range, what I would recommend you do is change your metronome so it's on pulse three. In other words, it's gonna sound like this. And that higher sounding pitch, that's going to be the first beat of every measure. Okay, that's going to help you with your phrasing. It will make the piece more musical. Um, then you transition from three beats per measure to one beat per measure. So the tempo I was just doing was 120. If I feel good about 120, I'm going to move to 120 divided by three. So instead of three beats per measure, one beat per measure. So that is 40. But I'm not just going to play it at 40, I'm going to play it at 40 subdivided into triplets. So here's 120 pulse three. Here's 40. With triplet subdivision. It's the same speed, it just sounds a little different. Now, once you've got a little faster than that, I, at this next step, I would recommend waiting until you get it to at least 50. But this is important. This is like, this is the money advice. If you don't get anything else out of this, this video, this is it right here. If you have the ability on your metronome to change the setting to something that sounds like this, this is what it looks like. So you see, it's like an eighth note, an eighth rest, and another eighth note. That setting on the metronome is very helpful for triple meter. I have theories about why, but what you need to know is it's going to help you a lot more than any other work you can do with the metronome that's the thing that's going to really 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 help you so that is the metronome aspect of learning this piece start it slow keep it at a tempo that feels very stable to you when you start to move the tempo up i have found that i can usually move it up about 10 clicks and hold on to the progress that i made the day before Sometimes you'll have magical days where you can just double your tempo, and that's great. That happens sometimes. But 10 clicks is usually a really good goal for how much you can do in a good practice session and hold on to that the next day. Um, okay, other things that we do at this slow tempo. So we get all of the notes, we get the rhythm. Now we start to also worry about things like pitch and fingerings and note lengths. So the musical aspects of the piece. Once all of that is baked in, that's when you start to go faster and you try to hold on to everything that you learned before when, at the new tempo. So let's talk about those things. Fingerings, pitch, note lengths. Um, there are a few fingerings, I call them auxiliary fingerings. So these might not be your normal fingerings, but I recommend them for this piece. The very first one that we're going to come to, 
First, let's talk about the first two measures of the piece. So G sharp in the staff is not a great note for us. The reason it's not a great note is because you need the perfect amount of half hole. Um, often the mistake people use is they use too much half hole. So not too much. Here's what it sounds like with no half hole. That's what we call a growl. And what's happening is both the high G sharp and G sharp an octave lower are trying to play at the same time. We don't want that in our sound. Here's with too much half hole. So it's not quite as growly, but it's a little muffled. Hopefully this is the right amount of half hole. See, it gives you a little bit cleaner sound. I've also found that sometimes you need to firm up your mouth just a tiny little bit. Just a little bit more energy in the corners will help the reed vibrate exactly the way it needs to for that G sharp. Okay, that's the first measure. Second measure, C sharp. Okay, so most professional bassoonists have two C sharp fingerings for C sharp above the staff, and we use them according to the situation. I use both fingerings equally. I think most bassoonists do. Um, so the first C-sharp fingering is the one I teach my students. It's called the short C-sharp. And the fingering is exactly the same as C-sharp in the staff, but just no whisper key. So one, two, three. And then in the back, you've got your C-sharp key and your bar, no whisper key. Like so. That's the short fingering. The long fingering. So one, two, three, C sharp key, but no bar. And right hand, two, three, four, and your pinky in your right hand is gonna be on the F key. So here's C sharp, short, and then long. I'll just go back and forth between them a couple of times. They sound very different. <laughs> That's why we, we tend to use both. What you get with the long C sharp is you tend to get a much cleaner sound. That also projects really well. So if I ever want something to just sound very, very clean, I go for the C sharp. If I need it to be loud, I also go for the C sharp. When I use the short C sharp is when I want something that's a little bit warmer and a little bit more flexible. So I am recommending that you use the, the long C sharp fingering for the first half of this piece. Everything that's got four sharps in it, I like the long C sharp. I actually move to the short C sharp when we change keys to five flats because I think that works better with the piece. So you don't have to do what I'm suggesting, but I want you to know about it and I want you to know why I'm suggesting it. Um, the other thing you're going to notice is that the pitch tendency of those two C sharp fingerings is very different. Short C sharp tends to be just a little bit flat, so you usually have to push it up just a little bit, and long C sharp tends to be pretty sharp, so you're going to have to push it down. That means that your pitch for the first two measures of this etude is going to be tricky. That's something you're really going to have to work on with a metronome and a tuner and not just one day. It's going to take some time for you to stabilize it and have it be in tune. All right, the other fingering I want to mention to you is G sharp above the staff or A flat. You have to play it both as a G sharp and as a, an A flat depending on which part of the piece you're in. The fingering that I teach my students for high G sharp slash A flat is whisper key, half hole two, three, and right hand, third finger. I teach them that one because I find that my students get really intimidated by that note, and this is the easiest version. So that's what I that's what I teach them. However, for this etude, I recommend whisper key, half hole, two, three, resonance key, B flat key, two, three. So what adding those extra fingers does, it doesn't really change the note, but it makes the note a little bit more stable and it makes it a little bit more resonant. So it sounds just a little bit better and it's just a little bit more in tune. I recommend you use that fingering for the entire piece. Um, one other thing that, oh wait, nope, two other things. Huh, sorry, okay, so F sharp. 
I'm very sorry. Um, but I'm not, this is something you need to know. So F sharp in the staff, there are two fingerings. Most people use whisper key one, two, three, half hold, of course. I don't actually recommend you use your resonance key. I find that actually makes it sharper. Right hand, one, two, three, and then your right hand thumb goes on the F sharp key. It's right below your pancake key. So like so. The alternate fingering, I call it pinky F sharp. Um, I've heard it called front F sharp, but I've also heard it called back F sharp. So I just call it pinky F sharp. Is instead of using your right hand pinky, you use your right, sorry, instead of using your right hand thumb, you use your right hand pinky and your right hand pinky is gonna go on that key right there, the most awkward one. Um, that's why I'm sorry, nobody likes this fingering. I have run into a few teachers who teach this as the regular F sharp fingering and then you don't care because you're just used to it. But if you're used to this one, you don't like this one. Um, I'm sorry, but we do need to use it sometimes. And specifically when we need to use it is any time that we have an F sharp, let's say G flat. G flat that's preceded by or followed by either an E flat or a B flat because with both of those notes, you need to be using your right hand on the B flat key. Incidentally, if you're somebody who hasn't been taking lessons from a bassoonist, there's a fair to decent chance that you learned how to play E flat in the staff, whisper key one, three, maybe with your resonance key. I strongly recommend that you start playing E flat in the staff, whisper key one, three, resonance key, B flat key, second finger, because if you add the right hand, it stabilizes the note significantly. Um, that's one of the first ways I can tell if somebody hasn't been studying with a bassoonist is they do only the left hand. I realize that a lot of middle school method books tell you to only use your left hand. It's because they think that it's going to be too confusing for you to also use your right hand. I disagree. I think you're smart enough. I think you can do it. I believe in you. Start using your right hand. Okay. Um, places where you need to use the pinky F sharp G flat in this etude, there are a few of them. I might miss one, so I'm sorry. But uh, the first place I think you really need it is measure 42 for that F sharp. You just don't have time to do it any, do it any other way. Next place, there are actually a lot of places after the key change where you go from B flat to G flat to D flat or E flat. So B flat, G flat, E flat, and they're slurred. Anytime that you have that, you really need to be using the pinky G flat. So I see those in measures 48, 62, 66, 96. Maybe there's another one I missed. I hope not, but yeah. The rest of the piece, you can use whichever fingering you like. I, it doesn't matter. But those are the places where I think you really need to use the pinky F sharp or you're going to be in trouble. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention, well, two things. Um, first of all, if you look at measure seven, there's a symbol that you see several times in this, in this book, and it's just an X, like that. It's in front of the very first note in number seven, measure seven. That is a double sharp. A double sharp means that instead of raising the note by one half step, you're going to raise it by two half steps. So we start with an F, but because of the key signature, it's actually an F sharp. Then to make it an F double sharp, we're going to go one more half step higher and that makes it the same note as a G natural. Now it's not a G natural, it's an F double sharp. And that's important because the note that is right after the F double sharp is a G sharp in this etude because G is not affected by anything that happens with F. The double sharp is an accidental, just like any other accidental, which means that once you see it, it lasts for the entire measure. Um, so measure seven, you're going to play an F double sharp, F double sharp, G sharp, A sharp, and B sharp, which is the same note as a C natural and then back to G sharp in measure eight. It should sound like this. Okay, 
The last thing I want to talk with you about is note lengths. And then I promise I'm going to play this etude for you. and Hopefully not mess it up. Um, the main thing to think about with this piece is you do not want anything to be too short. Even if it has a staccato, it's not a band staccato. It's an orchestral staccato, which means that it's lifted more than it is short. In other words, if I look at the first eight measures of the piece, I want something that sounds like this. Instead of. The second way I played it is the way that I would play it using like a more band staccato thing. This isn't a true like super short staccato. This is just not quite connected to the note after it. Um, throughout the piece, you want to pay attention to your notes, especially a note that is followed by a rest. If the note is followed by the rest, you do not want it to be too short or it's going to sound very abrupt. So for example, instead of do you see how the that's a little bit abrupt also when we go to the key change longer than it's written, but I'm not making it short. And I'm trying to end the note with a taper. Um, especially for the section that begins in measure 45 with the key change. There are a lot of notes that are not slurred and are interrupted by rests, but it should sound like one phrase. So you're not slurring, but it should kind of sound like you are slurring. The way you do that is by making sure that you don't end the note too abruptly and also don't make a big change in the dynamic between a note at the end, before a rest and the note after the rest. Make them kind of the same dynamic and that will help a lot. Okay, I've talked a lot. You've been very patient. Thank you for waiting, but there's a lot to cover with this etude. Um, I am now going to attempt to play it for you. I'm gonna do it at 70. I think that's a middle of the road high-ish tempo and um, just one beat per measure. The reason I do it with a metronome is I want you to hear it with a metronome. I want you to understand how the rhythm works. So let me get myself to 70 with nothing. <laughs> Vibrato. 
Um, I'll link a video for how to learn vibrato. I don't recommend you use it in the first half of this piece, but once you get to 45, you really should be trying to incorporate it into your playing. Good luck.